I'm Bernie Finkel, Master Stewart with the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy. We're up here at Brown's Ranch this morning to discuss how the Native Americans in this area use their plants to help sustain them. Some people believe that deserts are barren and hostile wastelands. So how do these people survive in this harsh environment? The Sonoran Desert is not like that. It is the most biodiverse desert in the world. Ethnobotanists who have studied the Sonoran Desert have estimated that of the 2,600 plants that exist here, at least 30% have been used in some way by the various indigenous cultures. To survive and even thrive in the Sonoran Desert, people had to have had an intimate knowledge of their environment. This knowledge was passed on orally through the generations, usually by mother and daughter. This knowledge became part of the group's ethnobotany and eventually part of their culture. Through the careful process of trial and error, they learned which plants to gather for food, medicine, fiber, and construction. While some plants provided a broad spectrum of uses to Native Americans, their most important function was to serve as sources of food. Most ethnobotanists agree that the most important plant in this region was the mesquite. The mesquite is a legume that has tap roots that can reach down to the water table. Like other members of the legume family, it produces seed pods which ripen in July and August. Seed pods are rich in carbohydrates, protein, vitamins, trace minerals, and fiber. Native Americans gather clean seed pods from the trees and the ground and brought them back to air dry for several weeks. The process of reducing the mesquite seed pods to flour entailed using mortars made from tree trunks and holes ground into the bedrock. Because the mesquite seeds were tough, stone or wood-shaped pestles were used to pound the beans. Generally, a stone pestle was used on a wood mortar or the reverse, but not stone on stone as it would break the seed, making it difficult to separate from the mesocarp. A basket strainer was used to remove the fibrous portion and the seeds. The resulting flour was rich in protein, complex hydrates, calcium, and other minerals. The flour was mixed with water and could be eaten as gruel or made into small cakes, dried and then used as a food source during the seasonal migrations or hunting trips. The saguaro cactus was another notable and important plant contributing to the food and beverage supply of the indigenous people of the southwest. In mid-April, flower buds appear and bloom through mid-May and mid-June. Flowers open at night and remain open until the following afternoon. These blooms are pollinated primarily by bees. Peak ripening is the last week of June through mid-July. A mature saguaro produces around 200 fruits a year, and each fruit has approximately 2,000 seeds. The saguaro fruit is nutritionally rich in protein, carbohydrates, fat, fiber, and vitamin C. For the indigenous people, the gathering process of saguaro fruit started on an early summer's morning. Women and children headed into the desert to gather the saguaro fruit from the tops of the tall saguaro using a long pole made of two saguaro ribs and a small branch cross piece. These were lashed together with rawhide or rope made from agave fiber. Fruit that had not split open from their fall from the saguaro were split open using the individual's thumb or the sharp calyx attached to the fruit pod. The sharp edge of the calyx we used to cut through the rind of the saguaro fruit. 
The calyx is the outer floral envelope that protects the developing flower bud. The red pulp and seeds were gathered in large baskets and brought to the processing area. At the processing area, fruit pulp was cleared of sticks and stones and soaked for several hours. The clean mixture was first mashed, water was then added, and the mixture was boiled for several hours. A straining basket was used to separate the juice from the pulp and seed. Once thoroughly drained, the pulp and seed were spread out to dry for a day. The juice was returned to the fire and cooked down to become a, a molasses-like syrup. The seeds were dried, stored, and then ground to make meal. Through the months of October to March, no substantial quantities of fresh plant foods were available to Native Americans, with the exception of that provided from the Hohoku Magavi and food they had processed and stored from the previous year. With no dairy cattle available to the natives, where did they get the calcium needed to keep them in a healthy state? In early spring, flower buds would begin to appear on the buckhorn choya. These buds are rich in calcium and other trace minerals and must be harvested before they flower. Many of the desert plants are rich in calcium but the buckhorn choya is very rich with two tablespoons of buds supplying the amount of calcium provided by an eight ounce glass of milk. The buds were gathered by twisting them off with two saguaro ribs lashed together to form a type of tongue. The buds were then rolled on the ground or thrashed with creosote branches to remove the spines and glockids from the buds. The buds were collected and steamed in a pit with a fire made on river rock with vegetation layered on the rock and buried under a mound of earth. After baking overnight, the buds were removed and were spread out to dry. They then were put into large baskets to be used later in the year as food or as trade commodities. The prickly pear gave the indigenous people two opportunities to harvest food from the plant. In spring, the young pads were harvested by using saguaro tongs to break them off at the joint. These young pads were soft and tender, low in oxalic acid, which made the older pads difficult to eat. The skin of the pad was peeled or their spines were stinged. The pads were then soaked like any green vegetable. The pads are rich in calcium and vitamins A and C. Several kinds of prickly pear provided edible fruit. The most important was the Engelmann prickly pear, whose fruit ripens in July and August. They are also harvested using tongs made from saguaro ribs. The spines and glockids were removed from the fruit by spreading them on the ground and thrashing them with creosote branches. The fruit would be peeled and eaten fresh or its juice made into syrup or jelly. The sweet and juicy fruit was an excellent source of calcium and vitamin C. Not all the food plants that were used by the Native Americans were native to this area. The Hohokam agaves, for example, were first brought here by the Hohokam and originated in northwest Sonora, Mexico. They were cultivated because they were a source of a sweet and energy-giving food. Agaves are monocarpic, producing fruit once in its life and then dying. The Hohokam agave reproduces by vegetative means by pups from their rhizomes or bulbils from their inflorescent shoots. Harvesting began in late winter when there was evidence that some of the agaves were getting ready to develop their inflorescence. Using digging sticks, the carbohydrate-rich crowns were removed and the leaves were chopped off using stone knives. These were then brought to the processing area. The agave pits were usually 10 to 12 feet in diameter, 3 to 4 feet deep, and were lined with rocks. A fire was lit and when it died down, vegetation was added. The agave crowns were added as another layer. Yet another layer of vegetation was added. Everything was then covered by a thick layer of dirt. 
The baking process for the Hohokam agave generally took three to four days. The fully baked crowns were removed and a portion was eaten. What remained was pounded into sheets to be dried and stored for use as a food supplement in the future or as a commodity to be traded with another tribal group. Today we have had a brief look at how plants contributed to the sustainability of the indigenous people of this area. But edible plants were much more than a source for food. The collective botanical knowledge of these people was instrumental in the discovery and development of a myriad of other products. In future videos, we will look at how plants we use for medicine as well as for fiber and construction. In the meantime, may I suggest that you get a copy of Wendy Hodson's wonderful book, Food Plants of the Sonoran Desert, published by the University of Arizona Press. There you will find a great deal more about the edible treasures of our Sonoran Desert.